appreciate all of you coming out tonight, uh, especially given the, uh, the inclement weather. Uh, so, some of you know, before I introduce the speaker, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm, for those who don't know, I'm Randy Wyckoff, the Dean of the College of Public Health at ETSU. Uh, but I spent 18 years in the federal government, including almost 15 years in Washington, D.C. And one of the things that I discovered in that time is something that a lot of people don't know. And that is that within the workings of government in Washington, there is a tremendous meritocracy. There are a lot of hardworking, well-educated, bright people that are deeply dedicated to doing the job that needs to get done. And in that environment, it's quite difficult and quite challenging uh, to rise up the ladder. And against that background, I'd like you to think about the accomplishments of our speaker this evening. Within 10 years of arriving in Washington, D.C., Dr. Rutstein has been promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral in the United States Public Health Service at a time when the single most important challenging issue in public health in our country is disaster preparedness and response. He's in charge of the Office of Force Readiness and Deployment for the Department of Health and Human Services. He is the senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Health and the Surgeon General on disaster preparedness and response. During that same 10 years, he served for four years as the Chief Medical Officer of the United States Public Health Service, three years as the Chief Medical Officer of the National Health Service Corps, numerous awards and recognitions. And what's most remarkable is that very few people can rise up that quickly, but even fewer do it as a second career. Dr. Rutstein, in fact, spent 13 years as a family doc on two different islands in Micronesia. So when he talks about community, he knows what he's talking about. When he talks about the federal government, he knows what he's talking about. He really is one of the nation's leading experts. So please join me in welcoming one of the true leading voices in public health, Dr. David Rutzler. Thank you. Thank you well, with that glowing, um, introduction. You know, that's not the kind of introduction you, you usually receive in Washington, D.C. Uh, so I, I know I'm not there right now. Uh, I am really just so delighted to be here for many reasons. But before I get into this talk, I, I really wanted to let you know how I met uh, Dr. Wyckoff. Uh, it's true. Uh, when I came back from Micronesia, where I had been assigned for quite a while with the Public Health Service as a family physician uh, living on some islands that had two hours of running water a day, two hours of um, electricity a day. And suddenly I find myself, I'm in the middle of Washington, D.C. I was uh, in culture shock, uh, basically in a fog for about two years. And uh, the people in Washington used to march me around um, a kind of as this oddity uh, that here's this person who doesn't know anything. He's been in this exotic place for, for a number of years. And I call this the Chauncey Gardner effect. If anyone has ever seen the movie uh, Being There, um, rent the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. But uh, the long and the short of it was uh, I really didn't know enough to pretend like I knew enough. Right? And um, all I wanted to do was try and survive this very foreign environment and see if I could contribute to the public's well-being. Lo and behold, at a conference, I run into the Deputy Assistant Secretary for uh, Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, Dr. Randy Wyckoff. And unlike many other people in Washington, he was completely unaffected by his title. And I said, gee, this is somebody I could really um, work with, learn from. So we began a collaboration. And when I, I told my um, bosses, and by the way, I had many, many bosses. That's the other thing about Washington. Uh, they said, you, you went where? You talked with who? And again, not knowing that you're not supposed to kind of go different channels, um, 
the long and the short of it was uh, this collaboration with Randy um, proved very beneficial to me and uh, it, it's something that I hold dear. That he, he, I've watched him um, after he left government go to Project Hope and now he's here and I wish him all the best and uh, one day perhaps I'll be like him. Now with that, <clears throat> today I'm going to talk to you about um, this topic of hurricanes, hot zones, and H1N1. The basic premise of this talk is to get you to ask yourself the question, are we prepared for all, all of them? My contention is that we're getting there. You've all seen this. This is Hurricane Katrina striking land for the second time. Remember the first time, it just nipped across the very end of Florida, very tip, before it went up into the Gulf. Um, it became a, hurricane, a category five hurricane. Uh, finally, by the time it, it hit land the second time, it was a category three hurricane. Um, the reason why I start this talk with this is because this changed the way we look at events um, that the federal government responds to. This was truly an event of biblical proportions. And um, we always think those kind of things don't happen here. They happen somewhere else. Well, it happened here. And how did we do? You've seen images of this, like this, like this. I don't think this works. He works. Uh, this one, this one. You've seen this image. This says, fly, fly us out, please. This is uh, in downtown New Orleans at a hospital. This is southern Mississippi, where the, the, the surge wave came in and went in three miles and scrubbed the, the, the uh, land for three miles, also in Mississippi. You've seen pictures like this and people pulling together, doing the best they could, all different sectors. And you saw that at the Superdome, there were 20,000 people, this makeshift shelter, right? And it swelled to 38,000 people, 1,700 people with special needs. 200 helicopters, um, I mean ambulances, and 44 different helicopters were brought in to try and address this situation, which was horrendous. Uh, this was not the kind of place that people should be living. You can think of sewage problems and food problems. And so, what were the accomplishments in this, in this setting? <clears throat> well, Amazingly, uh, from the public health point of view, there were no major communicable disease outbreaks. You saw people wading through sewage water. There was no major outbreaks. Uh, thousands of patients received treatment. Over 200,000 evacuees with special care needs were managed, and by this I mean these are people who could be living on their own with electricity or running water, but without those things, they're too fragile to do so. Maybe nursing home folks, maybe folks with chronic illness that need the electric power. Suddenly, when all that's gone, you have a lot of people who are very vulnerable. 
there was great risk assessment and disease surveillance was ongoing, trying to define what was happening. And the federal government provided tremendous technical assistance to both state and local health officials. But, but, uh, command and control of these activities was really not what it should have been. And um, we all saw and heard stories of patients stuck in hospitals that hadn't been evacuated properly. Uh, there was a weak state health infrastructure to begin with. Um, actually, at the time, uh, Louisiana was ranked either 49th or 50th in the nation. I see you guys walking around with a, a, you know, a no number 47 button. Well, you, you can take heart that they were, they were definitely below 47. Um, th there was terrible communications prior to the storm coming ashore, and uh, there was simply no common electronic health record available let alone any other kind of health record. So why do we focus on this hurricane? I said earlier that this hurricane was kind of, of biblical proportions. It highlighted for us in the federal government, really, it highlighted for us in the nation some inefficiencies that we need to address. Not just us in the federal government, but all of us together. And this is going to become even more important towards the latter part of what I'm going to say, which we'll, we'll begin talking about some things that are very pressing facing us in the very, very near future, right now. Okay, so Hurricane Katrina was and is a proxy for many types of hazards. And we can apply those lessons to um, all different public health emergencies. You know, there are all kinds of emergencies. There's these cataclysmic disasters that everyone hears about, uh, natural ones like Hurricane Katrina or the tsunami that struck Southeast Asia several years ago. There's man-made disasters. And 9-11 was a man-made disaster, a terrorist event, a series of terrorist events. But there's also unintentional man-made disasters, chemical spills, uh, nuclear plant problems, these are man-made disasters that are really not terrorist events. There are public health emergencies which um, require a response at a, perhaps a lower level. They may not reach the headlines. Uh, they may be regional or they may uh, be transient. It may be staffing needs. There's urgent unmet public health needs that, that, that may be created because uh, the nurses in the, in the school um, go on strike. And now you have populations at risk. There's national special security events. The Super Bowl, the Olympics, the State of the Union address. Uh, these are national special security events where institutions of our nation are vulnerable. And were something bad to happen with large collections of people, this could become cataclysmic. And then there's humanitarian assistance missions, missions that we identify that we should do some intervention ahead of time to try and mitigate uh, further suffering down the road. And there are many reasons for doing these. Well. This slide is too complex, but basically in 2005, um, shortly after Hurricane Katrina, um, it got people thinking of how do we plan for all these very diverse things? And we came up with 15 national planning scenarios. If you look quickly, some of them are attacks, some of them are natural, naturally occurring events. Some are, involve radiologic things, some involve biologic things, chemical things. The notion was we should develop a set of planning scenarios so that we can collectively train 
against these scenarios. And while it may not cover every contingency, it will help us to do a better job if something like this were to occur. Whoops, go back one. If you, if you notice up here, number three was a biological disease outbreak, pandemic influenza. Uh, I'm going to come to that. So um, basically, in a disaster, does that, an event occurs and the initial response is a local one. W once the local response occurs, and, and, and really the local folks get there before anybody else, things start to kick in. Who's in charge? Who, what government is affected? Who controls the resources? By the time people start asking these questions, usually the state gets involved, right? The state starts mobilizing um, assets to come to the aid of people. But when the local uh, assets are expended, the state makes a, re I mean, the local folks request assistance from the state. And the state responds by sending some resources. The governor may mobilize the National Guard, which is under the control of the governor. Well, what happens when the state resources are ex exceeded? The state makes a request to the federal government, and then the federal government tries to send resources. We're bad at sending resources, generally. Uh, it's not what we do, uh, particularly inside the United States. Now, if there's an overwhelming disaster, when suddenly the local and state infrastructures are obliterated, and this is what we saw in Hurricane Katrina, local and state governments cease to function there. Now, the federal government has to push resources to the state and local people. But you know what? We, we live in a federal system with 50 little autonomous little countries called states. <laughs> and they have little autonomous countries called counties, right? And towns. And these, these issues start to become bigger and bigger when the federal government starts pushing things down into the community. So how do we address that? There is a definite need. How do we address this? The only way to do it is to collaborate together. This collaboration has to happen within the federal government, between the different departments of the federal government, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Interior, Agriculture, Defense, but it also occurs between different entities. And it has to constantly be nurtured, this collaboration. If it's not nurtured, we can't do the kind of responses that we need to do. And Katrina has shown us that. So, right after Katrina, the White House commissioned an analysis of the federal response to Hurricane Katrina. And it brought together 11 federal employees, people who are apolitical, not um, partisan at all, and sequestered them away in the White House for six months to analyze the federal response to Hurricane Katrina. Um, conducted numerous interviews, all given top secret clearance, um, told that no one could interfere with what we were doing. And our charge was to come up with recommendations to advise the president on how this could never happen again. How the federal government could improve its response. 
So we came up with 125 recommendations, um, 17 critical challenge areas. These 17 challenge areas are listed here. Um, but you know what? It's, there's too many. Um, if you look at the ones in the middle, these are the ones that really um, are the key. And as a public health professional, as a physician, I personally think this one is the most important, public health and medical support. Because really, after all, in a response to something like this, the goal is to save lives, right? First, human lives are paramount. These other things are important, but saving lives is the, is the priority. Well, if you look at the list a little bit longer, you'll see what's listed first and last. National preparedness and citizen and community preparedness. I've come to believe that these are the things that will ultimately enable us to, to respond better. Let's go on. So of those highlighted areas, communications during Hurricane Katrina was abysmal. Right? The infrastructure was destroyed. Three million people had no telephone service. About half of the broadcast communications were gone. Responders and citizens couldn't talk to each other. And there was no plans to incorporate any existing communication devices. Logistics and evacuations. Well, the, the state and local officials worked with FEMA, the Department of Defense, and the Department of Transportation. Shelters were inadequate. You couldn't get people out of them, though because flooding impeded these efforts. You remember, it wasn't just a big bad hurricane. It was pushing a 30-foot storm wave, a, a, a wave that flooded the low-lying areas of Louisiana. And basically, <laughs> all of southern Louisiana is low-lying. And this constant flooding impeded the efforts, again, the lack of communications compounded the problem. Search and rescue was done mostly by the Coast Guard, FEMA, and the Department of Defense, but there was no coordinated plan. And with regard to law enforcement, there was some looting and violent crimes that occurred, but you know what? They weren't as bad as what were being reported. So it was the reports of them that really slowed the federal response. The criminal justice system was crippled. That's, that's being kind. It was gone. And um, although there were federal law enforcement officials who were deployed from the various federal entities, they had no authority to work together or to work within certain states or counties. Human services. Okay, reconnecting people with the services that are available. There was a huge need that overburdened immediately both state and local capacities. FEMA and the Red Cross kind of led the federal effort, but there was no single point of contact for people to try and sign up for existing resources. People were told to go home and, and sign up over the web. What's wrong with that picture? So mass care and housing. The immediate response uh, was to put people in FEMA shelters. These shelters were not really shelters. They were trailers that were being stockpiled and quickly developed. But the local folks didn't want trailer parks set up in their communities. Right? Yet, the, the VA, the USDA, and the 
HUD, Housing and Urban Development, three federal entities had thousands and thousands of vacant houses and apartments in cities where people were being evacuated to, but FEMA wouldn't utilize them because they didn't feel they had the authority. Public communications, and the, the difference between communications and public communications, communications is what people say to each other, and public communications is, is what gets said to the public as official instructions. The ability to, to coherently deliver public messages was gone, and often contradictory. So people didn't know what to believe. And this was compounded by the fact that the media was there before anybody else. They scooped up lots of information and reported many things that were erroneous. How did the state and local folks do? Well, as I said earlier, there was extensive damage and there was this complete devastation of their ability to communicate made it impossible for them to set up a command and control structure so that everything was discoordinated. Okay, so what was the health and medical support mission? Well, uh, the mission of the public health service, of the, of the federal health resources, was to identify, triage, and treat sick folks, to manage chronic conditions, in both uh, evacuees and these special health care needs people to assess, communicate, and mitigate risk to the public, to provide mortuary support. This was a huge thing because not only were people killed by the flooding and the wind, you had thousands of bodies that came out of graves, floated out of graves in caskets. And you know, they're, they're usually not labeled when they get put in the ground, right? How do you know where they belong? So this was a huge thing. Um, and assistance to the state and local health officials to try and help them get back on their feet. That was our mission. Well, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Defense collaborated with local and state folks. The National Disaster Medical System teams collectively treated about 100,000 people. Supplies were distributed from the Strategic National Stockpile, which is housed at the Centers for Disease Control. The Department of Health and Human Services deployed 24 different public health service teams and the Veterans Administration delivered care in their facilities and elsewhere. They did a great job in, in what they did in delivering care. But what lessons can we really learn from all of this? I mean, I've kind of showed what went wrong. Well, the first lesson is that we as a nation have to be better prepared. Not as the federal government, not as a consortium of little states, but as a nation. And that doesn't mean just government people. And we have to develop this culture of preparedness. You remember when we were kids, um, I know at least when I was, we had this drill when, we, you know, at school you, you, you put your head under the desk so you could survive a nuclear attack. <laughs> right? Now, we all know that wasn't too effective, right? <laughs> Had there been a nuclear attack, you know, the desk wouldn't have helped. But there was a culture of preparedness then that even as children we learned to try and act, do something, uh, to, to be prepared for bad things. We have lost that to a large degree. Katrina highlighted that. Another lesson. Disasters will continue to cause a sudden increase in the size of vulnerable populations. 
You could be a store owner in downtown New Orleans with credit cards, a vacation home, um, a, a great retirement account. One minute, there are homeless people living in front of your store that bothers you a little bit. The next minute, you're just as homeless as those people living in front of your store. There's a sudden increase in the number of vulnerable people that a disaster can cause. Now, admittedly, you might have a better chance of kind of doing something about it if you're a little bit more educated and have other resources. But what we saw in Katrina was that it was a great equalizer. Many, many people who didn't consider themselves vulnerable prior to Katrina suddenly became vulnerable. And we as a nation have to kind of figure out how do we care for these folks? Because these folks can be any of us. So that's why I say vulnerable is a relative term. The next one is that responders have to operate according to a single plan that's understood, practiced, and evaluated by everybody who uses it. Well, we used to have a federal response plan. Then it became the national response plan. After Katrina, it's now called the National Response Framework. We also have a national incident management system, which gets, allows everybody to talk the same talk from the federal government to the people who, who drive the fire engines. This really came out of that lesson. Disaster response efforts must include the ability to communicate, first of all, to communicate operably, and then to communicate together. So you have to have walkie-talkies in the first place. Then you have to have walkie-talkies that can use the same frequency, right? That's the difference between operable and interoperable. We didn't have that in Katrina. The military must be more effectively integrated into disaster responses. You know, there's, a, there's a, almost a, a prejudice against using the military inside the nation's borders. People confuse this with a prohibition of posse comitatus, which effectively prevents the military from conducting police activities inside the United States. But that's all it prevents them from doing. We learned in Katrina that the military has tremendous logistical capabilities. Unlike any other entity in our nation, they can lift, move, and resupply people we need to make better use of them. Well, from the public health point of view, we get back to communication. It wasn't the supply of drugs or vaccines or, or anything else that became key. Communicating to the public is the single most important function to prevent disease and death following disasters. That's the single most important thing that we in the public health community can do. I want you to remember that. That's why I put it in yellow. And think about how the H1N1 outbreak was occurring last spring. Think of what you saw on TV over and over and over again. Responders must be from all levels of the government and the private sector. When bad things happen, it's not just the responsibility of the government, and it's not just the responsibility of the private sector. It's our responsibility. So we have to work collaboratively. And it, we can't just say, oh, only physicians can be in charge. No, anybody who can do something should be in charge and should be in the fray. Local and state health departments 
must get better at being prepared. They must improve their capabilities, and we must help them to do so. We, as a nation, have to invest in local and, and state health departments if we expect them to be able to respond accordingly. And as citizens, we have to help our local and state health departments to be that way. And then finally, the responder community has to somehow use a common system to communicate health information about patients that are being seen. And ideally, this would be an electronic one. Many patients were treated. There was something slapped onto their uh, shirt, put in a gurney, flown someplace else. That thing got, gets lost. No one knows what treatment was done. People were evacuated. Children, no one knows where they're from. So we have to have some record system in America that we can use, or a system of systems that can talk with each other to address these problems. Well, I mentioned the National Response Framework. Um, this has been revised. It continues to be revised. It was revised last in September of 2007. The, the emergency support functions um, really de define what is, who, which federal entity is in charge of these various 15 areas. Emergency support function number eight is public health and medical services. It's headed up by the Department of Health and Human Services. So HHS. The, the, the department I work for, during a, de a presidentially declared disaster or a disaster declared by the secretary of HHS or the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security becomes in charge of this stuff. But we don't have planes and ships and helicopters, you know? We depend on other entities to move things, to keep people secure. So the, the fundamental issue here is the entities that are, have the capacity to do these things should be in charge of their respective areas, right? In Hurricane Katrina, FEMA was trying to be in charge of both managing the situation they had a, a health care force. They had a housing force, a human services force. Meanwhile, these other departments really have the inherent capabilities, but were kind of in the background. So that's enough of Katrina. I'm going to just show you a few quick other pictures of other bad things. These are the Midwest tornadoes of 2003. You may or may not remember them. San Diego wildfires of 2004. The Indonesian tsunami of 2004. 300,000 people died in that one, by the way. Uh, three months later in Indonesia, an earthquake, the fifth largest earthquake in human history occurred. The island of Nias. Did anyone remember that one? Uh, very few people heard of it. It was devastating. Southern California wildfires in 2007. You may remember those. Just last week, we sent people to American Samoa for the tsunami in 2009. These things will continue to happen. Naturally, and unfortunately, man-made causes. They will continue to happen. We, collectively, have to be prepared for them. So how is anything I've said relevant to the influenza pandemic that we are in now? Is any of it relevant? 
So let's see. You know, influenza, you've heard, is a serious illness. Every year, 36,000 people die of influenza. Every year in America. Um, and there's over 200,000 hospitalizations from influenza. The biggest toll, of course, is, is, is taken on elderly folks, people with chronic diseases, infants, pregnant women, and nursing home residents, people who are housed together. But every year, this is the, the morbidity and mortality. To review, you know there's basically two types of influenza. Influenza A causes epidemics and pandemics. It spreads between animals and humans, and uh, it affects all ages. Influenza B is milder. It's only in humans, and it mostly affects children. It's not as serious of a problem. The influenza virus itself has two proteins on the external coat, hemagglutinin and neur neuraminidase. These proteins help us identify the, the virus. And I won't go through all of the typing and straining, but basically all of this happens to be about whether it's A or B, where it was first identified, when, etc. Well, pandemics definitely happen. We know in 1918, there was a pandemic that was, we're still talking about, almost 100 years later. In 1957, the, quote, Asian flu, and in 68, the, quote, Hong Kong flu. We've stopped referring it to it by where it's from or what animal it came from. We initially, by mistake, referred to this as the swine flu, and many people stopped eating pork, right? Almost shut down the pork industry just by, by, by saying that. Erroneously, while there are some components of uh, pork flu in this, swine flu in this, there are also avian and other human components as well. The net result, though, is these outbreaks occur, pandemics occur often. Let's look at some of the mortality from some of them. In 1918, 1919, in two waves. First one in the spring, wasn't so bad. It came back in flu season. And about 50 million people died, died worldwide. 680,000 people died in America. About a 2% case fatality rate. In the Asian flu, 70,000, that's about twice what you would expect from seasonal flu. The Hong Kong flu, actually less than what we see annually from seasonal flu. What is going to happen now? We're in a pandemic, right? Well, there's been some planning that's gone into this, some thinking about it. Documents were produced the, from the White House, from the Department of Health and Human Services, describing different guidances to states and local partners, using a great, to a, to a fair extent, the, the strategies that came out of the Katrina report. Um, so we have these documents, but having documents and being in the middle of a pandemic are two different things. What's our strategy? What are we trying to achieve now? Well, it's the same thing. We're trying to reduce illness and death and minimize social disruption. That's the basic strategy. And when you think about it, that really applies to, to almost any disaster. Some of those long lists I showed you, that's what those lists come down to, what we're trying to do. So in this, this pandemic we're in, this, this H1N1 is a new virus. In other words, we haven't been exposed to those particular hemagglutinin and neuraminidase proteins in the past. So we don't have the immunity 
that we would normally get by getting exposed to this year after year as flu spreads through the, the nation. That's what makes it kind of worrisome. We don't know how many people could die from this. It appears to spread more rapidly among children than seasonal flu. Um, there's large outbreaks in some schools. Last spring, it didn't seem more deadly, more virulent than, than seasonal flu. So all the communication that was occurring got people very concerned. But then when it didn't become really deadly, people started saying, hmm, someone is trying to pull one over on us. The, the sky is falling, you know? Well, the best thing that can happen in public health is that you can be wrong because then the sky doesn't fall, right? Nonetheless, the communication occurred. And the, the interesting thing about this virus um, is it tends not to affect the elderly as much as seasonal flu. Normally, it's mostly older folks who die from the seasonal flu. That's not really the case in H1N1. So this, in the spring, this occurred late in the, in the flu season. There was a lot of heterogeneity across the United States. It, it, it appeared differently. It functioned differently in different states. Um, as I said, it affected young people more. It caused widespread illness. Some of it was severe and fatal. Um, but that was mostly among people who had other illnesses. It caused tremendous social disruption because, perhaps because, we did such a good job at communicating, schools shut down. Remember? Now children weren't going to school. Parents had to stay home and watch them. What happens? Or children go to the mall instead. Right? So this social disruption um, is a very serious thing. And then it mobilized thousands of health workers throughout the world to try and address this problem. Thousands and thousands of people were mobilized. Our current strategy is really around these four things. Disease surveillance, mitigation, vaccination, and there's that word again, communication. So what do I mean by surveillance? Well, what we do with flu every year is we look at how flu is acting in other parts of the world. We do the same thing with H1N1. And you know, right now, right now, 45 states report widespread or regional influenza activity, H1N1 influenza activity not seasonal flu. The morbidity is about twice the baseline. So about twice as many people go and seek care from influenza-like illness, ILI, than is the national baseline. But guess what? We haven't seen really an elevation in deaths above the national baseline. What does that mean? If you look at the states, you'll see that um, the, the brown states report widespread activity. The kind of, I don't know what color that is, it's kind of a, a green or yellow, is local or regional. There's a few states that haven't reported. If you look at the deaths, this is just since uh, August of August 30th, we have about 1,300 deaths, 16,000 hospitalizations. These deaths seem like a lot, but it's really not above the baseline. The hospitalizations are a little bit above what we would expect for this time of year. This analysis is done by the CDC every week to keep track of this. We're no longer just tracking confirmed cases, 
but any influenza-like illness. Why is that? It's because, really, just about every case of influenza-like illness turns out to be H1N1 now. But again, people with underlying conditions are the ones who are most at risk, as well as people who are pregnant. This global surveillance is in concert with WHO, PAHO, which is the Pan American Health Organization, and other countries in the southern hemisphere. As we see what happens there, and we adjust our preparedness based on what's happening in the southern hemisphere. If you look at the, the, what's happening, most of the disease and deaths were in the southern hemisphere as H1N1 spread there during their flu season. Their flu season is ending and ours is beginning and the question is, are we going to see deaths increasing in the northern hemisphere where we live? This slide just tries to show that from the spring to now, the blue is the percentage of, of influenza cases that are due to H1N1, and the purple is any other type of influenza. You see, virtually 99, more than 99% of the confirmed cases of influenza now in America are H1N1. So, how do we strategize to assess the social impact? Well, we have to share data. We have to inventory what's happening in the private sector. And we have to develop a system that helps the existing medical care systems um, increase their capacity and monitor those people who are getting sick, particularly those who are getting really sick, like who are in the ICU. Because that tells us something about the virulence of this disease. How do we mitigate? There's non-pharmaceutical ways, there's antiviral treatment, and then there's advice around how and who to treat. So you've heard about the non-pharmaceutical ways, right? Sneeze and cough into your sleeve, wash your hands, um, stay home when you're sick clean surfaces, maybe close schools if you have to, but try and keep them open. These are the non-pharmaceutical ways of mitigating this emerging disaster. If you do treat, we have two basic drugs, um, Tamiflu and Relenza, and there's guidance from the Centers for Disease Control on who gets treated. Basically, the answer is you treat hospitalized patients with suspected, probable, or confirmed. It doesn't have to be confirmed. Because remember, more than 99% of people with flu have H1N1. And we treat people who are sick and have other risks. But you know what? We don't routinely treat people who have mild illness. All of this information you can get from the Centers for Disease Control website. I'll give you that in a minute. The other aspect of this is encouraging primary care physicians to treat people and advise people without sending them to the emergency room. Because when you send people to the emergency room for something like this, it can shut down our healthcare system. It's not designed for this kind of surge. And so we, at all levels, have to develop ways to teach people to self-triage themselves, right? We have to prepare hospitals for bad things if this doesn't work. We have to teach people how to use ventilators again. We have to get them out of stockpiles. And we have to begin strategizing to um, shift personnel to better staff 
uh, intensive care units. And we have to take care of the people who care for all of us because the healthcare workforce is very vulnerable. And this is why when the vaccine recommendations came out, you'll see that people in the healthcare industry are some of the first who should be receiving the, the H1N1 vaccine. Speaking of which, the vaccine program. Well, I'm happy to say, we'll go on, I'm happy to say that the vaccine is now available through many trials have taken place at NIH, CDC, FDA, as well as four different pharmaceutical entities. Um, there is produced a live attenuated influenza vaccine and just yesterday it was received throughout the country in various locations, including, I know at least one, one place here in Tennessee received it. The doses are small um, and it's, it's obtained by the states. States can order this through their state health departments. So here's the place. I, I don't know where this is. I know Memphis is far away from here. R Randy, w Randy was telling me that, that you're closer to Canada than you are to Memphis. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, this Children's Medical Center in Memphis received a couple hundred doses. Why at a Children's Medical Center? It wasn't for the children, it was for the staff at the Children's Hospital. Okay, and all of these recommendations come out of the Advisory Committee of Immunization Practices, and these are the people who should be vaccinated ultimately uh, with vaccine. However, I should point out that the initial doses of vaccine, the live attenuated version, is really meant for children that are over the age of two and adults who are under the age of 50. So from two to 50, not people who are pregnant and not people who have any other chronic diseases. More vaccine will be coming for them Mostly, the initial vaccine was designed for healthcare workers. This is the address where you can get more information about the flu. Communication again. Keep children at home. Read the guidances. This is all available through www.flu.gov www.flu.gov. What are the challenges of a, of a vaccine? Well, producing enough, quickly enough, getting it to where it needs to go, and getting people to believe that it's safe. Because inevitably, there's going to be suspicion that arises about whether this vaccine is safe. You guys produced it so fast, I know you didn't really test it appropriately. Hmm? The message here is this vaccine was produced using the same methodologies, the same protocols that we use every year to produce seasonal influenza vaccine. No shortcuts were taken. So, again, this becomes a shared responsibility when we address H1N1. All of these entities have to work together, not just government entities, certainly not just the federal government, local and state governments and tribal governments, healthcare systems. Most of our healthcare systems in America are private. They need to be at the table and engaged in this. Schools, businesses, the media. We saw what the media can do, both good and bad, in disasters. We need to have them at the table. And then finally, down to the individual level. So 
These are the, this is the lesson from Hurricane Katrina. But it really applies to all hazards, to all hazards. So are we prepared for them? Well, I think we're better prepared. I do. But we have more work to do, a lot more work to do. Oh, yeah. But we have to do it together. I mean, that's the take home message. So, in summary, competency determines responsibility. Those who know how to do something should be the ones doing it. That's what that means. A strengthened public health and medical command drives successful efforts. In other words, if the main mission is to save lives and prevent social disruptions, it should be the health industry, the healthcare workers who are setting the tone and determining the pace. This is not a war on people, it's a war on disease, right? To do this, you have to have effective communication to the public. You have to engage various levels of health departments, and they have to step up to the plate. You have to integrate all kinds of responders, as well as the assets. And then finally, you know, you've seen me talk about this, mention this several times. This word collaboration, it, it really doesn't occur between organizations. It occurs between people. It's people who, who exist in these organizations, whether they're government or private or academic. It's people who have to talk together and function together. So I'm acknowledging a few people who helped put some of these slides together. My deputy director, Dan Beck, he's an engineer. And he thinks like an engineer. He, he's, he's, engineers have done more for public health than most people know. And Claire Helminiak, who works in the office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. She is our point person for H1N1 at the federal level. So a lot of this information about H1N1 came from her. The last thing is, I always put a slide in here about the public health service. People ask me why I'm in uniform. Uh, they often confuse us with the Navy. I remind folks that, that the Navy's uniform looks like ours. Uh, <laughs> that in, in fact, um, there's one of our uniforms that predates the Navy by four years, and I remind my Navy colleagues about that all the time. But basically, we have a proud history. We began in 1798. President John Adams called us into service, created the Marine Hospital Service. About 100 years later, we were put in uniform. And our initial mission was to care for merchant seamen because America's economy depended upon these merchant marines. Um, and when they brought back illness, it affected the entire country and our entire economy. The mission was expanded and now the public health service, we like to call ourselves the few, the proud, the anonymous. <laughs> There's only about 6,500 of us. We're all officers. Um, we're one of the seven uniform services of the nation. Uh, we are in more places around the world than all the other uniform services combined. They have two million of them. There's 6,500 of us. The, the way we do it is we put one way over there, two over there. That's how I ended up on Micronesian Islands for 13 years. Right? Anyway, if anyone's interested in more about, more about, go back one, more about the Public Health Service, you can get it, information at 
at usphs.gov. So this is me, my address. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. There's one more, if you click one more time, you'll see the symbol of the Public Health Service up there. Thank you very much. Um, so for some of you who aren't from academic institutions, raising of the hand is sort of a traditional uh, <laughs> signal to be called on. I'm Larry Mastin. I'm a retired executive. Mm -hmm. it, it appears to me that obesity has almost become a pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly is bad in Tennessee and in several other states I've lived in. Is the National Health Service addressing that as a pandemic at all? Absolutely is. I can tell you that in the office of the Surgeon General, we have four priorities. One is prevention, and the number one uh, item we're trying to prevent is obesity, especially among children. This has become a pandemic in, uh, in, in the world, particularly in America. And there's many reasons for this. Um, it's, a, it's a systemic problem that has to be addressed uh, at many levels. Not only the amount of food and the type of food that we serve our children, but the amount of exercise they get, the amount of time they spend in front of screens. These all are parts of the equation. But this is the kind of thing that um, threatens our very economic survival. Right now, we spend about 16% of our gross national product on health care. Um, about two-thirds of us as adults are overweight or obese. When we were children, 4% of children were overweight or obese. So the 4% grew up, and now two-thirds of us are overweight or obese. Right now, 17% of children are overweight or obese. What happens when they grow up? How much will we spend on health care as a result of that population? Because we all know that with obesity comes greater risk for chronic disease that's very costly. So this is a, it, it's a public health problem, but <laughs> to me, it's an economic problem. It's a national security problem. And uh, it's something that we're banging our heads against the walls, trying to figure out how to break this conundrum. As I said, it's a very complicated issue, and it has to do with lots of different vested interests in America. Hi, I'm John Dreisner. I'm a physician in a, in a rural public health doc. I have uh, four county health departments in this region, uh, uh, southwest Virginia. We kind of consider northeast Tennessee and southwest Virginia to be one place. Okay. Um, I've often thought, uh, you know, as I've been doing this job for, you know, uh, close to a decade, and I've had a chance to work with several EIS officers from time to time when things have happened and formerly wore a uniform myself, uh, I've, I've really learned that, uh, in, especially where disaster preparedness is concerned and all hazards, uh, relationships really matter. Mm. Um, and uh, I know my Tennessee counterparts very well. I know folks in, in neighboring states. I certainly know my state folks uh, that I can call on and my local folks, but what, who I don't really know are my federal folks. Mm -hmm. um, I know my FBI officers. We've had mm -hmm. some occasions to interact in, the, in anthrax and so forth, but I've often thought, wouldn't it be great if there was some federal person whose job it was to be the face of the federal response uh, you know, in some region? I recognize you couldn't possibly do that in every county, although that would be great, um, but if you could do that in a region, you know, where that person was, you know, around the table when we attend, uh, you know, we have our various regional meetings and so forth. Is that an idea that's come up? I'm sure it's happening in some places. And I, I, it, 
If it's happening here, I've never met the, never met the person. Okay, th there's several ways to answer this. One is, remember I told you the public health service is the few, the proud, the anonymous? Well, we're becoming less anonymous for that very reason. There used to be a time when we weren't really in uniform. Well, the uniform it allows us to stand out and to be recognized as a federal asset to the community. So you're going to see more and more public health service people in communities, assigned to community health centers, assigned to state and county health departments. That's one way. The other is an initiative that really began under the auspices of the Surgeon General called the Medical Reserve Corps. About seven years ago, with a small amount of funding, $10 million, which is nothing in federal government, and really came out of the events of 9-11, uh, volunteers were identified in local communities that have day jobs, they don't get paid, they come together and they form units. These units started off with a few. There's now 180 different units around the country, 180,000 people around the country who serve as volunteers in these medical reserve corps. That's all under the auspices of the Surgeon General. I encourage you to go to the Surgeon General website, surgeongeneral.gov, and you can find out where Medical Reserve Corps units are in your community. And while those folks are not, you do. Good. Excellent. The, 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 the nuance about this is for the first time in the last year, the Medical Reserve Corps and the Public Health Service Commission Corps have started training together. So people from your local unit will be invited to train with us and get to know us and vice versa. So you'll have people in your unit who who are a link back to the federal government. So I, I'm, I really hope people will take advantage of the Medical Reserve Corps. Ken Silver, Environmental Health. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the culture of preparedness. Mm -hmm. uh, in my view, a culture of preparedness did develop after 9-11, but it developed along the wrong lines. And I would say it overemphasized external threats and excessive militaristic thinking, and this relates to one of your other points about mm -hmm. the role of the military. Mm -hmm. On your 15 disaster scenarios uh, that a federal panel flushed out, there was an attack on a chlorine tank. Fortunately, that hasn't happened, but just down the road in Graniteville, South Carolina, a chlorine tank with a railroad company cutting corners uh, did leak, killed seven people who thought they were safe at home. Intentional contamination of the food supply was on that list. Meanwhile, um, E. coli, salmonella, spinach, beef being recalled, that's not an external threat. Anthrax, there were journal articles, conferences, symposia, and even after the journal Nature gave us molecular biological evidence that it was an inside job mm -hmm. based on the DNA sequences. And it even got so absurd that you know an artist in Buffalo was prosecuted for using microbes in his artwork or was threatened <laughs> with prosecution. A Texas professor lost his job for more serious offenses and uh, may have gone to jail. And now swine confinement facilities are citing biosecurity as an excuse to keep out the job safety and health inspector while workers in the swine confinement facilities are getting respiratory disease. So I trace this back to excessive militaristic thinking because they're really good at secrecy. And I'm in your corner. I'd like to see resources transferred from them to you so that there's more than 6,500 of you folks and we rebuild the public health infrastructure and put a floor under salaries for our graduates in state and local health departments, which are now you know, pretty sad. But I do have a question. Why would any of the 11 members 
of the White House task force investigating Hurricane Katrina need a top secret clearance? What was secret about that civilian episode? That's a good question. <laughs> um, it's a funny quirk of uh, the way the federal government works when it collects data from these kinds of events and begins planning for them. Remember, these events are not just seen as a single natural event, but planning is begun for that can be relevant to actual attacks, right? So when, you're, when you have people who are looking at documents, planning documents that are, are, are designed to flesh out how we would cope with attacks, the rationale is you need to give those people top secret clearance in order to see those planning documents. That said, very few of the things that we actually looked at ended up being uh, falling into that category. I will say that that document that was produced, I was in the room when the press was allowed to see the document. The president announced it, saying he had formed this panel, this was why it was going to be, he, he called it into being, 125 recommendations, he's approved them all personally. Um, I, we hope that this will, will prevent uh, this, these kinds of errors in the future. He told his entire cabinet, I want your deputies to come back once a month and report to the deputy of the Homeland Security Council on the progress you're making in implementing all 125 of these recommendations. The entire cabinet was very, um, you know, agreeable to this. Then the press came in, showed it to the press, went through the same explanation. The first question, tell us about the Dubai port deal. Remember that? Okay. So there was an answer about that. Then the next question again was the Dubai port deal. There was not a single question about the, the Katrina lessons learned report. When the press went out, the president then said, remember I said I want your deputies to come back every month? Now I want them to come back every two weeks and report on the progress you're making. In, in, uh, in implementing these recommendations. The point is that by having people who are apolitical to produce this report, the attempt was to give them a credibility. And when you have people like that, you have to give them top secret clearance to get the political folks to allow them to see the documents that are being produced. Well, David, thank you very much. And before, before you step down, we do have some parting gifts for yeah. you. Um, this has become somewhat of a tradition here. So the, the first one is, um, you know, as I said, there are a lot of accomplished people in Washington, but there's very, very few who have this. <laughs> the status of honorary professor in the College of Public oh, Health. Oh, well, that's okay. very Dr. nice. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I'll treasure that. But, but, but wait, there's more. You also have your very own copy. I, I know you, you, you feel isolated from, from real America. So here's your very own copy of the Encyclopedia of Appalachia. <laughs> Everything that you need to know about us is in there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and I have some uh, other gifts for you that are more specific to the College of Public I have something Health. for you. Uh-oh. This is a, cut the cameras, please. You know, there's a tradition in the uniform services when you want to honor somebody, you give them your personal coin, especially among the flag ranks. That's admirals and generals. So I carry around with me a coin, my personal coin, and it's traditionally done in a handshake. 
And it's called a challenge coin, but th that's my simple way of, of honoring you. Thank you so much for everything you've done.